right, if you have your Bibles, turn over to Matthew 24. Matthew 24 and verse 35. Matthew 24 and verse 35. Say, doing my part. Say, doing my part. Now, the, a couple weeks ago, we started the message that we are currently in concerning the power of a person's will. It is the most powerful thing uh, that God gave all of his creation. It's will, willpower. And so we've already taken the time to show that all of God's creation, within the realm of God's creation, he's given the power of will. We saw this in the realm of what we consider the spiritual realm or the angelic realm. And there's not just angels. There's cherubim, seraphims. There are archangels, right? Uh, and so based upon the class of angels that there are, they have a will. So much so that one was able to decide that they wanted to take over God, the creator's throne. So they were not programmed created beings that were forced. So let me say it this way. The angels that are flying around the throne singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord, are not forced to do so. They choose to do so. And they choose to stay on the same song. They're not made to do it. They choose to do it because they choose to do what they were created to do. Are you hearing me? They've not been programmed. He created them, and they chose not to abandon where God created them to be. They thrive in their purpose. I said they thrive. Dr. Miles Monroe said this concerning refrigerators. He said, the manufacturer of a refrigerator never designed it to be a coffin. However, if you notice, if one is out on the side of the road, the majority of the time they're taking the um, doors off because kids inadvertently have gotten into refrigerators or freezers when they were set outside to be discarded or just in someone's yard that was not in use and they saw it as a good hiding spot and in return they died or suffocated within it. And that was never God, never the designer of the refrigerator or deep freezer. It was never their design for it to be a, ultimately a coffin. What well, do you understand? If you do not function as the manufacturer designed the product, it can create death. So when the creator creates every realm and every creature, he creates them with a ability to thrive in the environment and live. A lion can swim. But you drop a line off in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, it will eventually die because it cannot sustain swimming long enough to make it to land. It wasn't designed for water, although it can get in water. Are you hearing me? So again, it's not God's fault if a lion drowns if he keeps his head underwater. Because if the lion decides, I want to be like the uh, orca. I mean, I'm the king of the land. I want to become the king of the ocean. And I'm going to go find me an orca and kill it. Well, is it going to happen? No, because he's leaving his domain. He's leaving where he was designed to be, and it's not what God wants. But if many he does this, then he violates the will of God for his life, although he could choose to do so. Are you hearing me? So the same thing is with humanity. God get built, made us in his likeness uh, uh, according to his design. We are a copy of God. In essence, we were given dominion on earth to function like God did in the earth and on the earth to rule this earth like God rules his realm in heaven. And the minute we get out of that, then death comes. Yet God allows us the choice. And here's the thing, 
This is why God is just. Because God will let you do whatever you want to do, but he'll hold you accountable to the only thing that has life, and it is his word. You can choose life or, and the obvious answer is, should be. Should be obvious. However, God doesn't make us do death. So we've been dealing with, because it's the reigning spirit, it's a year we want to talk about the reigning spirit, and in order for us to be able to function with the reigning spirit, which is greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world, if you're going to have the reigning spirit dictate you to have a reign, to reign in life, you are going to have to yield your will to the will of the Holy Spirit of which the will of the Holy Spirit is the will of Jesus, and the will of Jesus is the will of his Father. Now, Jesus has a will that he chooses to not accept above his own fathers. Just like the Holy Spirit has a will that he chooses not to accept over Jesus. Are you hearing me? So as a result of that, they are always in unison because they know the will of the Father is where life exists. And we want to maintain life, not only life, but light, everything that is good is there. We saw last week that in him there is no darkness. So God cannot be tempted with evil because God is not evil. There's not a yin and yang about our father. Our father is only good, only light, only just. Are you hearing me? So because of this, we've talked about this reigning spirit because in the last of the last days, the spirit explicitly says that there will many, some will fall away from the faith, giving heed or paying attention to uh, doctrines of demons and seducing spirits. And so we're kind of knocking or dealing with a demonic thought, which is God is in control. Okay. And the reason we're dealing with this is because God controls what God controls, but God does not control everything. Because we are giving God credit for stuff God's not even involved in. In fact, he's worked everything out so that you don't have to get involved in that, nor does it have to happen. God is in control of his word. Now, if we would take a step back to the definition of control, which simply means uh, to have power over or to exercise restraining, or here it is, directing influence over. Most people, when we say God is in control, we say it's the act uh, or, or instance of controlling, like God is actually controlling every situation going on, which means if bad happens, God controlled that, right. or we say it this way, he allowed it. Right. In essence, God is authorizing it. God is, wants it to take place in your life because we use this as such a blanket statement. However, if we use the word control as influence, now God does do that. He is trying to influence you so that you'll choose Life. I said you'll choose life because God in his creation, although he brought a design, although he communicated how things would grow, reproduce, and all that, in the, in the context of those who have free will, he allows you to have free will even at the expense of you going against what he says. And what's so awesome about the love of God is even though he knows you will go against it, he provided the way for you to get back in to obey. But if you don't get back into obey, then you'll reap the consequences of disobedience and rebellion. And it's not because he controlled you to do that or he made you do that. You chose. So when someone says, I can't believe a loving God would put people in hell, he doesn't. They all choose to go. Because they chose not to accept Jesus as Lord. They chose to be God themselves. And he said, there will be no other God above me. So I'm obligated to my word. 
Which means if you think you're telling me what to do, that doesn't work. <laughs> because I am the source of life. That's again the clay telling the potter. And this is the challenge. All right? So God is not controlling everything on the planet. What he controls is his word. He always does his word. His word always comes to pass. Again, how can God be controlling and we read Luke chapter 8 and mean controlling everything? Luke chapter 8, verse 11 through 15 says it this way. Uh, let me read the Matthew. Sorry, I never read that. Matthew 24, 35 says this. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Why? Because he does his word. I said he does his word. Now, with that being said, Luke chapter 8, verse 11 through 15, it says, now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. And heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will not pass away. I said it will not pass away. So the seed is the word of God. The word of God, which God controls and makes sure it comes to pass. He goes on and says, those beside the road are those who have heard, that's the word, then the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart so that they will not believe and be saved. Verse 13, those on the rocky soul are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no firm root. They believe for a while, say a while, wow. and in time of temptation, fall away. The seed which fell among the thorns, these are the ones who have heard, and as they go on their way, they are choked with worries and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit, say no fruit, no fruit to maturity. Doesn't mean they don't bear fruit, it just has no maturity, which means it doesn't reach the place that you can taste and see that it's good. It reminds me of one time when I peeled a banana off one of my banana trees because, you know, it wasn't turning yellow. And I didn't, I hadn't studied how to harvest the bananas. And so I end up pulling them off, right? And I'm like, okay, well, let me try this thing, you know? Uh, and so I bit into this banana and there was no, no uh, moisture in this banana. It sucked the moisture out of my mouth. I thought I was going to swallow my tongue. It was the most bitter, uh, sticky, icky thing I've ever tasted in my life. It was a banana. I could peel it. I could bite into it. But it was not mature. And it made me spit it out. It was a banana off a banana tree. I knew it by its fruit. But its fruit was nasty. And I spit it out. Didn't want nothing to do with the rest of the fruit on that, whatever that's called when it produces that little thing, you know. I'm like, there, the re I'm not even trying another one. Get thee behind me, Satan. <laughs> Type stuff, right? I mean, this is nasty. But it's because it's not brought to what? Maturity. Now, I learned later on how to do that. And that same tree, when I learned what I was supposed to do, I ended up peeling that banana off. Man, it was the, man, they were so sweet. They were amazing. So it wasn't the tree's fault in and of itself. When, when I say that, it was because, I mean, I, the part I needed to play with it or understanding what needed to take place, right, um, in that, um, because I didn't do my part, then it couldn't fulfill its full part. And this is the problem we have with the Lord. God will do his part. The question is, will you do yours? Verse 15 says, but the seed in the good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart and hold fast, hold it fast, bear fruit with perseverance. So there's nothing wrong with the sower because the sower has sown seed. Some fell to the wayside, some among rocky soil, some among thorns and some in good ground. There's nothing wrong with the sower. There's nothing wrong with the seed. Because the same seed he was pulling out or she was pulling out of the bag and sowing went into the good soil and produced good fruit. The problem was, was the, the soil or what received the word. 
And this is how it is with belief. God's not in control of how you're receiving it. You're in control of how you're receiving it. You know, sometimes people can come here and not receive anything that's happening because they're offended with me personally. And offenses can happen in multiple ways. One, they could be through familiarity, not because I've actually done anything. They just hurt me for so long. They just treat me like I'm anybody else. And, you know, the minute I start saying something that they've already heard, they're checking out. They're spending too much time doing this on their phone. They're distracted by all these particular things, and they're not listening to anything I'm saying. It could be that, you know, a correction had to be made at one particular time and they didn't particularly move in the direction or they just know that I'm aware of it. And even though we've restored it and reconciled it, the enemy keeps coming back and saying, oh, but they keep remembering it. Oh, you know, they're still treating you this way, you know, and, and, and lying to them. And as a result of that, they're not receiving anything I'm saying. And it's not because the sea's not liberating or, or, or life changing. I mean, when we first started the church, you know, I had people that were uh, my senior, basically my age now at 53 or a little bit older that would show up because when I started at Faith Church, I was 34. And when I would preach the word, they couldn't receive it because of how young I was. They despised my youthfulness. And there was nothing wrong with the seed. It was their ability to receive what was being said. It couldn't bear fruit. I've had some in the beginning years that when we were sowed the seed, they so much, they so wanted me to be the last minister that they felt the move of God in that they were trying to put me in the image of that last pastor instead of letting me be me. And when I wouldn't put together the church like the last move of God they were in because it's been so long since they've been in church. It wasn't, there was nothing wrong with the seed, nothing wrong with the sower. It was the person receiving. Are you hearing me? So then if God's in control, don't you think he could make a tree bear fruit among thorns? Or that he could make a tree bear fruit among the rocks? Because we say, well, God can do anything. So even if it's in the rocks, even if it's got a little bit, God can still do it. God doesn't violate his word. And God doesn't violate your heart. God doesn't violate your hearing. Although the seed's there for you to grow, develop, but it's up to you. Because right now in this service, some are going to leave and say, oh my gosh, Pastor, that was so powerful. Oh, it changed my life. It was so good. Others will be like, whatever. Whatever. It's true. This is why when pastors ask me how many people attend my church, I think it's the stupidest question on the face of the planet. Because my question is, is how many people are actually applying what I'm preaching? That's the real question. (laughs) Because I don't care whether there's five people or 100,000 people. If I have five people and all five of them are applying it, I would rather have five people and then all five apply than 100,000 than none of them. Because we change the world with five doers. We can just look like we're doing something with a hundred million. <laughs> no, they're known by their fruit. And their fruit is known by how it tastes. Are you hearing me? So bearing fruit alone is not enough if it's not matured and it tastes and it actually tastes like the things of God. Are you hearing me? So God cannot force anyone against his will, but only influence it. And that's what he does. So the will is the power to control one's own actions and emotions and mental powers manifested as desiring, choosing, or intending to determine by an act of choice. And everyone in this room has a choice. Determines. And every one of us, this will is always being bombarded. Always. Thoughts are always coming and attacking it, talking to it, speaking to it. Always. I mean, you know, you have to will to not check your Instagram in here. You have to will to do that. Because the minute you're looking at your Bible on your electronic device and a notification pops up, you have to be intentional to not look at it. If you look at it, 
Did it make you? Just because it notified you didn't mean it was telling you, you better check me. In fact, the notification doesn't move your Bible screen off and put it on and say, you're looking at me now. Because if that was the case, you'd never find your Bible app. So many notifications would be running through your phone that you'd be constantly seeing all your notifications. You know, I have this little, I'm a little, um, in a, in a term known in the world, OCD, I don't like the little red dot, you know, circle that tells me I need to deal with something, right? I mean, I want to eliminate the red dot. Even if I have no interest, I just don't show me that I got something. Get rid of the thing, let's go on, right? So that's why I don't follow a whole lot of people because I don't want a bunch of red dots where I got to go on and deal with stuff. Amen. But you're having to make a choice. I said you have to make a choice. You know, you have to make a choice to be intentional to listen. When I was at Rama, I worked a third shift job. You know, and I could have said, well, I'm here, aren't I? Look at all these people here. Ain't none of them work all night like I did. Only a handful in this room. They don't know what I've been suffering. You know what, if I snap a little bit in class, I mean, God, I'm here, aren't I? I mean, I did show up. I mean, are you going to receive anything with that attitude? No, you have to be intentional. So I had to be intentional. I had to say, I got to get up. I'm going to have to go stand up in the back of class. If I just keep sitting here, I'm going to fall asleep. I'm just, and much as I'm fighting it. And you know what? The ugliest faces in the planet are the one who's falling asleep and trying not to. <laughs> you know? I mean, videotape your spouse falling asleep but trying to stay awake. I mean, do it here in service because it's happening. And then just say, see what you look like in service today? You say, pastor sees me. Honestly, I don't see you because I don't really pay that much attention to your face. Because if I did, I wouldn't preach. I would assume you all are offended. <laughs> because I don't have a bunch of people going, this is amazing. I love this. Come on, preach to me, pastor. I love this. No, you're not looking like that. Like, okay, I'll preach this anyway. And the more your face gets like stone, the harder I preach. Because when you're plowing ground and it gets rocky, man, you come with hammers. You come with chisels. You come with pounding. You know, if it's flowing easy, then it's easy. If it gets hard, just know somebody has got some hardness kicking in service. We need to pray for them. We need to get them some breakthroughs so Pastor can move on to some lighter things. Hallelujah. First Thessalonians, that preach fast, so thank you. <laughs> Get participation now. <laughs> All right. First Thessalonians 5, 23 says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit, soul, and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, just because you can control, because again, you are deciding what you decide. God can influence you with the right choice, but you ultimately choose. And you may, in your three-part being, have something really well, but in the other two parts, not. Again, some people know how to yield to the Spirit really good in service. When they get among other believers and the worship begins to go and they begin to tap into God and they'll sing and shout and run and dance, man, and they'll be in church and they'll amen everything. But then the minute they leave and get outside the church body because they don't know how to make their will get their soul together, then if they hear bad news, their emotions will override everything they know in the spirit. They'll begin to speak hurt, speak doubt, speak worry. They'll begin to cry over situations. They'll let situations devastate them emotionally, even though uh, uh, emotionally they will be distraught. But if you talk to them, they're like, I know God's going to take care. And I know it. Well, then why are you crying so much? Why are we whining? Why do I hear this emotional response from your soul, although you're telling me from your spirit God's got it? How come your soul is not lining up with your spirit? Well, okay, we may have a control here in the spirit realm, but we do not have willpower in our soul. Then we need to have willpower in our body. 
Lord, I need you to heal me. And sometimes the Lord's like, quit eating this or that. Lord, I have this. And he's like, well, you're going to need to control how you're eating this. Amen. You can say God can heal you of cancer, but if you're smoking cigarettes, how's this? Again, well, God's in control. If he wants me to be healed of cancer and emphysema, he'll do it. He'll do it. All the while, you get to enjoy your cancerette. Sucking your nicotine. I mean, you see what kind of, say, control God has? Yeah, God's not overriding your will to continue to put contaminants in your body that hinders the natural order of your body. And let me tell you, God's already doing a lot for you because he's already said if you take any deadly poison, it won't harm you. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's in our uh, United States, the way we do food, that's harmful enough. And thank God that he put that in there to help us along the way. And when our spirit's alive, it can do a lot for our body. It can permeate through. But we still have to choose how much we're putting in here, what we're putting in here, and how often we're putting in here. And that's not God's in control. That's... Now, nobody wants to talk about this, but that's all right. I'm the pastor that will. I have no problem with this. Because he wants to sustain you with long life. See, here's another thought process. Well, you're going to live as long as you want to live. That's not true. Well, God's got your days. Well, he actually said through Paul in the Corinthian letter, he says some sleep early, which means they shouldn't be in the grave. It wasn't God's ordained time. Well, you know, when you go, you go. No, you can accelerate that process. In fact, there are many that stand before the Lord. And he's like, what are you doing here? Now, it's not that he didn't know you were coming. It's more like, you shouldn't be here. What? You shouldn't be here. But I called on your name. Well, yes, you're born again, but you shouldn't be here. You're early. You're early. What do you mean I'm early? I thought you, you know, you, <laughs> I thought it was my time. You were in control. I wasn't in control of your date. You were. Okay. I mean, that's how the scripture talks. We can lengthen our days and we can get them shortened based upon how we respond. You want long life, it says obey your parents. What's it imply? If you're rebellious, you shorten your days. And that's not God. That's you controlling your calendar on the planet. You're controlling it. You know, some parents are outliving their kids. Could it be that the reason you're outliving your kids is because your kids have been so rebellious, they can't have the promise of long life? Oh, I'm preaching good now, but that's all right. Because why? We take certain thoughts to such an extreme that it begins to apply across so many areas and demonic spirits have picked up and have convinced the church of all kinds of things that aren't even reality. No, this is a Berean church. We're going to search the scripture for ourselves to see it. so. We're not letting anybody, I don't care who it is. I mean, Paul was so adamant about this. He said, now listen, if I come back and preach to you a different Jesus, I am accursed. In essence, don't ever, just because I was rightly dividing at any time of my ministry, assume I am still doing the same thing. You better judge this thing. You better study this thing. You better get in the scripture yourself. You better make sure the Holy Ghost is saying that. Right? But most people sit in churches and believe everything the person on the platform says. Because they say, the Lord showed me. Well, they no more know how to hear the Lord than you do. That's why you assume they're right. And you want them to be right because you want to hear from God, but you won't take the time to do it. You want someone else to put forth the effort. Now, not you, but you understand. All right. So again, we have the willpower for our whole life. How well you are in life is only dependent on you. 
So this eliminates your ability to say, well, I can't be or I couldn't because of. That does not exist in the Bible. Whatever God destined you to be, no one can stop you but you. No one. No one. Even if you have a tyrannical leader, can't stop you. Even if you have was brought up in the worst environment, can't stop you. Doesn't matter if the devil personally comes to your house daily, <laughs> rings your doorbell, doesn't stop you. Doesn't stop you. There's no excuse for you not to fulfill God's plan for your life except for you. Will you be wronged in this life? Yes. Will the devil come after you? Maybe. Maybe. Because he ain't coming after everybody because number one, he's not omnipresent, which means most of the people he's not coming after because they haven't even conquered the flesh and there's no reason to even show up at your house. There is no Satan showing up at your house when you've not learned how to rule your own flesh. If you haven't learned how to rule you, he doesn't have to come. <laughs> if you're already making excuses, he doesn't have to show up. So y'all need to go out there and read Cows, Crows, and Constellations. You need to go buy the book. If you had not read it, you need to go get it. If you've read it, you need to obviously read it again. If you start thinking, oh, well, you know, so-and-so did, I, and I can't believe, and now I can't. Many of you say I can't, then that, and you're associating it because of someone else. Now, someone can stop a process for a bit. Someone can try to delay an effect. That can happen. But they can't overcome you or the purpose God has for you ever. Because if you're doing the work God told you to do, it's going to come to pass. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 through 25 says this. We said this last week. I want to expound a little bit more. Let me just read it and then we'll come back. But I say, walk by the spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desires against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, uh, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarned you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice, say practice, practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, uh, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Self-control. What? Self-control. Against such there things there is no law. Now, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. So we see here in Galatians that it starts out, I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not. Who's responsible to walk by the Spirit? Is God making you walk by the Spirit? Is God behind you? Uh, come here, uh, Rick. Come, on, come here. Come here. This is what people are at. God's in control. Does God love Rick? Does he love him? Does he only want what's best for him? Does he want him to thrive in life? Okay, now uh, we get to the other side. Everything here going forward is going to produce life for you. And God wants you to have it. Now, how's he going to get there? We think that God's doing this. Because he's in control. Now, come back and resist me a little bit because everybody's always resisting the Lord. Ready? Go. That this is what God's doing. Oh, because he's stronger than I am. Go ahead and try a little bit better than that, you know. There you go. See what I'm saying? Because that's what they're really doing. And we're like doing this, right? And that God's going to make, because he's in control. You're going to get the blessing. By God, you're going to get the blessing. Right? Come here. Or we think it looks like this, that the Lord takes us. Stop. 
and puts us there. Why? Because we listen to the lie of the little uh, poem that God's footprints are the only ones in the sand. And then we, he picked us up and carried us. Okay. Come here. You want, you want to know why there's one footprint in the sand? It's because his foot is my foot. He don't step except in the place I've already stepped. There should have never been two. So why do we think there's two during the good time? And we have built false doctrines off that poem. Because Jesus said we are in Christ. We are one. We're one body. There is no such thing as an army of us running with our own little footy prints. So he is to be led. You want to go to life? Then follow me. Right? And he has to do this of his own free will. I'm not making you. I can, you still back there? We still coming? Because I'm leading you in the paths of righteousness. You can be seated. You see what I'm saying? Yet all the while we have given God this power that he doesn't have because he gave you power because he wants to know you love him. Amen. Does your um, phone love you? I mean, it'll tell you. Some of y'all even program it so you say, hey, Siri, who's the most important person on the planet? It says your name. <laughs> I mean, you program it to say that. But you know you put it in in order for you to reciprocate the response. Amen. But yet we want to be like that to God. Where we're forced to do whatever he makes us. Well, that's not love. Love said, I'm going to make them, I'll give them a will, and let them choose me or reject me. But I am life, and if they do what I say, it's always life because I'm life, I'm light, I'm love. But if they don't, then I'm just because they chose not to love me, and I know it. I know it by their actions, their behaviors. So if we walk by the Spirit, we will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Well, that's why you can't, oh, Lord, take away all this stuff, this temptation. He's not doing it. He doesn't have to do it because he put the greater one on the inside of you. He's already given you the greatest spirit, the reigning spirit. But you have to choose to say, not my will. What do you say, Holy Ghost? So when it comes to immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, when it comes to jealousy, outbursts of anger, when it comes to envy and drunkenness and carousing, these things that you could do at any, any believer at any time that's born again, filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues, casting devils out, raising the dead, any, at any time can say, I'll choose the flesh. Absolutely. And the only reason why people aren't fleshly is not because God made them not fleshly. is that they chose to not side with the flesh. That the reigning spirit on the inside is saying to your new spirit who can hear from God, say, yeah, we don't do that anymore. You don't have to. You're not forced. It's not your nature. You can choose otherwise. You have the power to do life. So I'm, I'm going to encourage you to do it. I'm going to encourage you to do it. So one of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control. 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 So 
if the fruit of the Spirit, that's by the Holy Ghost, can give you self-control, then how can anyone be controlling you? How can any circumstance be controlling you? Because God himself, God's giving you a piece of him, which is, I control myself. You know why God never goes to evil? Because he's always under control. He controls himself. In fact, some scholars believe that the reason why the devil is still trying to do what he's doing today is because he's convinced himself that he can make it so bad down here that he can get God in his wrath to the point that he steps over his own righteous line and acts in anger because of what he's doing to people. He's convinced that if I can just get him to fail in his own fruit, then he can't be just and I can win. Because he's already been defeated by Jesus. He's already been stripped of his authority and power, yet he's convinced. I can create such havoc that it takes God even out of his own nature because of his compassion for humanity. I'll move him to action beyond justice. Many believers try to step into situations because they're mad at something being done wrong, and it is something being done wrong, but they move in without the legal authority. I just can't take it no more. And that's what the devil's convinced will happen with God. The good news is he will not lose self-control. Proverbs 25, 28 says this, like a city that is broken into and without walls is a man who has no control over his spirit. This, this message is like so liberating to me. To know that God innately through creation put within me now from the beginning, although Adam fell, we all sinned, but now that I've made Jesus my Lord, that will that, uh, that caused me to denounce Satan same will. This will that was doomed to destruction that never went after God. No one goes after God. No, not one. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Yet within this capacity of will, I'm able to hear from heaven of a Savior that loved me so much to keep his word about my original design that he was willing to empty himself from his realm, get into my suit because that was legal entrance to the earth and take on my sin so that I would have the opportunity to be back in the dominion the first Adam lost and I could have enough willpower to say, you're the wrong dad. You've been deceiving me my whole life. You've ran me down and I've been in bondage. It's been dark the whole time. All the relationships, all the sex, all the drugs, all the pursuit of my own happiness, the pursuit of wealth, the pursuit of everything, the, the, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, all of it is vanity. But God, and though I'm shackled and chained at a word, with my own will, I can say, Jesus, I believe. And his finished work that he had to do was able to come and meet my will and my faith and break those chains off, 
shove that spirit man that was dead in me out of my skin suit and put in me a new spirit and then have the reigning spirit move in with me and say, now let's get your mind cleaned up. Let's get your body under control. You know, when I talk about the body being preserved blameless, you know how many Christians are fornicating? How many Christians are committing adultery? It's, we don't even have to talk about a food issue. Let's talk about a sex issue. They're living like the rest of the world, trying to figure out, because I love them. Well, you know, if I die, I'm not going to go to hell. If I can't keep their body in it because they don't have the willpower to say, I got to go home. Girl, I got to go home. Quit playing that stuff. Don't play that song. Do not play that song around me when I'm with you. Because that is just faith being built in my body. Come on, you hear what I'm saying? Have you listened? Y'all listen to secular music. Don't act like y'all don't listen. My wife and I went to Cracker Barrel yesterday. <laughs> I like Cracker Barrel. I love the breakfast. Right? Right, Mary, John? Yeah. However, they play country music. It's not my favorite at all. Okay? I like songs without words. <laughs> but my wife and I were listening to this country song, and I, we thought, my God, this is horrible. Now, what's bad is I'm fixing to tell some of you because you already know it because you've listened to it already. It was the first time my virgin ears heard this song. <laughs> the whole song is about a guy and a girl hooking up because they're trying to forget their exes. Because they both got dumped, so they going to get together. I don't remember all the words. That's the gist. I said, well, I've never heard, but you've probably heard. You, listen, it's getting in whether you're trying to pay full attention, but you are paying attention more than you think. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So at the end of the day, <laughs> I'm like, we put stuff around us and then we're like, I don't know why I acted like that. <laughs> well, because you're feeding I said, you're feeding. We act like it's archaic. When it's really just trying to live holy. Because our spirit man's well able to overcome sexual temptation. But bro, don't, your body is not. And if you feed the fire, Proverbs said, how can a man take fire in his chest and not get burned? Well, I guess the Lord wanted us to sleep together before we got married. <laughs> Or this wouldn't have happened because God's in control. All right. Proverbs 25, 28 again says, like a city that is broken into two and without walls is a man who has no control over his spirit. If you're born again, you have no excuse. None. No excuse to not thrive. None. No excuse. You have none. And don't think God, you're going to look at God one day and say, Lord, it was just so hard. God's going to be like, what? How? How? It was not, it was only hard because you wanted it to be hard. You wanted it to be. I mean, the Lord was very clear when he said, take my yoke, for it's easy. <laughs> now, I'm not going to say that there's not trials and tribulations, but those trials and tribulations are not hard. In fact, anytime I get under pressure, well, this ain't hard. I just say what God says about it. This is not hard. There's a number one, a way of escape. There's a way to do this. This too shall pass, because it wasn't here yesterday. Didn't have this conflict yesterday. But now here it is. But this too will pass. I just got to find the way. Because I got a reigning spirit. And I'm going to will myself to his will. 
Because when I do his will, his word. Proverbs 16, 32 says this. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he who rules his spirit is better than he who takes a city. Joseph Benson said it this way. For the conquest of ourselves and of our unruly passions requires more true conduct and more steady, constant, and regular management than the obtaining of a victory over the forces of an enemy. I'm going to say that again. For the conquest of ourselves and our own unruly passions require more true conduct and more steady, constant, and regular management than the obtaining of a victory over the forces of an enemy. And I realize, you know what? I have to deal with me way more than I have to deal with trials and tribulations. And out of the whole time I've been following God, I'm still not sure that the devil has shown up and tried to find me. Do I think he has sent a few of his, you know, Cohorts, yes, absolutely. But has he himself shown up? Not sure. But if he ever does, I have a word for him. It is written. Are you hearing me? Because it's the same word that Jesus used against him. Now, I'm not asking him to show up. But I am saying this, I do know that he's working with cohorts to try to destroy this church because he's trying to bring weapons against this church. But what do I say? It is written, no weapon formed against the church will prosper. The devil is not the church's problem. You are. You are when you do not submit your will and control it to go to his will. The only reason why the church has a problem, this is why the Lord said, I command you to love one another. Now, to love one another means to keep each other in the word and be doers of the word. Not saying, I love you. 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 That's not what he's saying. It's not what he's saying. Nor is he saying to love one another, which means accept everyone that's a brother, but still practices sin and lives sinly and acts like it's no big deal. No, that's not how we're supposed to love that brother. The Bible has another way to love that brother. And that love is to put them out. It's what it says. That's loving them. And anyone can come back repenting. James chapter 1, verse 19 to 22. Therefore, my beloved brethren, y'all doing all right? Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not work out the righteousness of God. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and overflowing of evil, receive in meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But becoming but become doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving our own selves. I love this, and the reason I use this context because Proverbs 16, 32 said, he who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit is better than one who takes the city. And most of the time we read James and we say, beloved brethren, verse 19, let every man be swift to hear and slow to speak and slow to wrath. We stop there, or we go on to the next one, and we say, you know, that um, for the wrath of man does not work out the righteousness of God, because when you're angry, when you are basically determining I'm going to do what I want to do, then you can't hear what he wants to do. That's why the wrath of man, okay, does not work out the righteousness of God because I'm going to do it. This is how I feel about him. That's just how it is. That's what I feel about him, period. No, I'm not. I mean, seriously, have you not had that conversation with the Lord when he starts talking to you? No, I'm not. No. I mean, you get kind of mad about it. Like, really? Really? You're going to make me do what? I got to apologize to her, my wife, my husband, my kids, my employer, my mama, my sibling, (laughs) whatever. But if you're not, 
then in essence, you can't work out the right. And then it goes on to say this, therefore putting aside, because when anger, you're going to, if you don't deal with your self will, that is feeding the emotions of the current situation you're in. It's amazing how many born again, spirit filled, run around the church, hallelujah, glorify God people that the minute someone attacks your kids, you go unrighteous. Someone say something about you personally, you go off. It's amazing how quick a person's emotional response kicks in. And he's like, if you would deal with this, then you would put aside all filthiness and overflowing of evil. Because here's the thing, if someone is actually doing you wrong, the Bible tells you not to pay, repay evil with evil. Which means your first response shouldn't be like, ah, oh, bush. What? I mean, we're like moving ahead like, I'll take care of this. Stand out of the way, Holy Ghost. I got this. Bro, I got this one. No need for you to get involved. I know enough of your word that I don't need you to tell me right now. I'll enact it on my own. That's when you get into law. It's you interpreting the word on your own merits. But he goes, look, receive in meekness the implanted word, which is able to what? Get your emotions under control. Hold on a minute. Holy, Holy Ghost. Woo. Give me that self-control real quick. Come on, give it to, give it to me. Just eat the fruit of it. I got this. I got this. I got this. And the minute you yield to self-control, then now you're obligating the Holy Ghost to say, I'll fulfill self-control. I'll help you. And then when he gives you the word to do, he said, now I'm going to put the grace in there. We're going to get this done. This is going to be amazing. And again, if it's not happening that way, it's nobody's fault but yours. But become doers of the word. Not hearers only. This, well, you know what this tells me? That the Holy Spirit is always telling us the right way to do it. Always. The question is, do we do it or do we not? And the minute we don't, we're deceived. And we use scripture to justify our behavior. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Oh, man. Do I have time for this? <sighs> we have a water baptism. Y'all all right? I mean, I won't be here for a few weeks. Can I preach a little bit longer? Just a tad longer. I'll, I'll go quick. Ephesians 5. I'll, let me just read this. This should be pretty self-explanatory, okay? I will interject as I go eat quickly. Ephesians 5, verse 1. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. So who's responsible for imitating? God can't make you imitate him. And walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma, which means God was always looking for the way that we could bring restoration, even though judgment needs to come according to this situation. However, I can do an amendment and act a way so that I can cover the injustice. And if we w operate in this way, the injustice can be covered. It can be dealt with. It can be paid for. And then we can open up this lifeline in that situation. Let's imitate God to do that. So he goes on and says this, but in morality, right? But immorality or impurity or greed must never be named among you as it is proper among the saints. There must be no filthiness. Okay, and silly talk or coarse gesturing, which is not fitting, but rather given of thanks. For, for this you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. So these things should not be habits around persons that are saints. And if they are, the Bible says they don't inherit it. So don't think once saved, I'm always saved and I can live like a hellion and God's good with it. That is not a true statement. That is a doctrine of demons. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the, the sons of disobedience. So anyone who tells you you can do whatever you want to do under grace, they're deceiving you. And God's saying wrath is showing up. So anyone who says, well, God's not mad at you. God is mad at every action that is disobedient. And he's actually getting more angry. He's storing it up. Don't like that. 
Don't like that. I don't like that. That is an injustice. That's not my word. That's going to have to be dealt with. I'm going to deal with that. Oh, I'm going to come and show. I'll show up here. Yeah, that's going to happen. Oh, yeah, keep doing that. Yeah, it's coming. I'm going to show up. I'm going to show you who I am. I'm going to tell you that I'm holy. You're not going to mock me. You sure ain't going to blaspheme my name. No, you're not going to do that. Oh, it's coming. Oh, it's coming. And all the while he's doing this, mercy's going out saying, repent, repent, repent. Because if you don't repent, wrath is coming, and it's coming with justice, and it's coming righteous, and it's going to deal Deal with the ungodly. Because God is not going to let the ungodly snub the righteous and act like it's okay and it's a free pass. So, therefore, do not participate or be partakers with them. For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. So it's your responsibility to walk as children of the light. God can't make you walk it. You have to walk it. For the fruit of the light consists in all uh, goodness and righteousness and truth. Try to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of things which are done by them in secret. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light, for everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason it says, Awake sleeper and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine in you. Therefore, be careful how you walk. How who walks? Who walks? God's not picking you up and carrying you. He's not forcing you. He's not pushing you down the paths of righteousness. You have to walk it. Walk as not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of God is. See that? But don't be foolish. Understand what the will of God is. Yield your will to his will because he will perform his will and his will is life. Do not get drunk with wine for that is dispensation, but be filled with the spirit. Speak to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melodies with your hearts to God, always giving thanks to all things for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, um, to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of the Lord. I close with this passage, uh, Isaiah 55, starting in verse 6. Isaiah 55, because we're going to put this in context now. Context. We preach this word all the time, but here's the context. <laughs> Seek the Lord while he may be. Which implies you can get to a place you can't find him. Call upon him while he is. Let the wicked forsake his way and let the unrighteous man his thoughts and let the unrighteous man his and the unrighteous man his and the unrighteous man his and and let him return to the Lord. Verse seven, and he will have compassion on him if he what forsakes his thoughts and to our God and he will abundantly pardon. Why? Verse eight, here it is. For my thoughts are not your, and nor my, your ways, my. So what's he saying in context? Get rid of your thinking, get my thinking. Get rid of your will, get my will. This is not mystery. Well, you know, the Lord's ways are higher than our ways, brother. He's in control. It always follows that first. The Lord's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. The Lord's in control. We just don't know. He says in verse 6, abandon your thoughts. Go to the Lord. He's saying, look, you want to know what I'm thinking? You got to get rid of what you're thinking. Verse 10. And for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, my thoughts than your way thoughts. For as the rain and the snow, uh, snow come down from heaven and do not return without watering the earth. Look at this. And making it bear and sprout and furnish seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So will my word, which goes forth from my mouth, it will not return to me empty. In essence, he says, I've given you the power to will. And if your will will be my will, if you'll abandon your thoughts and those actions and take my thoughts and my actions, then you put me in a position where I will confirm that word in your life always, forever and ever. Amen. Forever settled. It'll come to pass. Can't stop. Won't stop. Will always be that way. 
because you control whether I can get in control of the word in you. And if you'll get, let me come control what I control in your life, then it always comes to pass. Let's pray. 